Hi folks, this time we're going to talk about energy. Energy is defined as the ability to do work. Now if you remember, work is force applied through some sort of a distance. And what that means is if something possesses energy, it can exert a force through a distance. Um, your human body possesses energy and so it is a capable of exerting a force on a bicycle and making it move through a distance. This pile driver lifts up, has a lot of energy due to its position, and when it falls back down, all that energy can be given to some sort of a pylon that it is pounding into the dirt. Food can contain chemical potential energy, energy that can go into moving your body. Electricity can actually contain energy. So once you have an electrical appliance, um, the electricity coming into it can make a fan blade turn or can toast your piece of toast nice and golden brown. Something as small as a bullet given enough velocity will possess enough energy to do work or apply a force through a distance on another object. Now energy units are the same as work units. Joules, calories and kilocalories for food calories. You're going to see joules and kilojoules on food packaging, especially if you go outside the United States. One of the places I noticed joules being used as an energy unit, I took my um, Red Cross certification a few years back and when I did that, we had to practice with defibrillators. And on the defibrillator, it says so many joules of energy that are actually given to a patient when the defibrillator is being used. Now there are two big, broad categories of energy. And they are called kinetic energy and potential energy. And we're going to spend some time later giving you some math about each, but let's describe them both before we get too far along. Kinetic energy is energy something possesses due to its motion. This bicycle has energy just because it's in motion. The bullet, which is such a small little thing, but it has a lot of energy because it's moving. Electricity in motion is called electric current, and that is basically just electrons flowing or moving. Those electrons possess energy. The wind that blows to run these turbines that is a form of kinetic energy. And sound actually makes air molecules wiggle or move through a compression wave. That motion is transmitted to your little eardrum and that gets turned into neurological impulses that we interpret as sound. Now potential energy is energy of position. Because this person has climbed to a very, very high hill, if he drops his car keys from here all the way down to his car, way the heck down there, he could actually dent his car. They're just car keys. Why in the world could they dent his car if they got dropped from that high position? Because the position of this far above the ground has given that object stored energy. Food contains what we refer to as chemical potential energy. Trapped inside of the bonds inside of your food is energy that is actually stored in those bonds. The process of digestion breaks those bonds apart and energy is released. That starts the entire beautiful biological energy cycle in the human body. Water going down over a cliff or down a waterfall has potential energy due to its height. As the water falls, it can be used to run a hydroelectric dam, it can be used to run a turbine or a water mill. Lots of other types of motion can be changed from this potential energy or the height of the water. A stretched rubber band contains a lot of energy. You let it go, it's going to snap back, ouch, and it's going to hurt your little finger. But there's a whole bunch of elastic kind of things that store energy. Everything from car springs to garage door springs to um, balls when they bounce. Gasoline is another form of chemical potential energy, and energy is released when those chemical bonds are broken. And voltage is not exactly the same as electrical potential energy, but it's related to something called electrical potential. And that is really, really, really close. Not until we get deep into electricity will we start explaining those subtle differences. Now, one of the big 
laws of nature is the law of conservation of energy. The law of conservation of energy says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It just changes forms. It goes from one form to another to another. When we start getting into our energy math problems, one of the things you have to look at is that chain of energy. What kind of energy did you start with and what other forms did that energy become? So there's always some sort of work that's done. Energy is stored. The energy can then do work on something else and that energy gets used up. There's a big cycle of energy that is constantly changing from one to the other. So let's go through a couple examples. There is chemical potential energy in your food. That chemical energy can be used to power you and you get motion. Now, you can then take your motion to climb a hill on your bicycle and you have some stored potential energy due to your height, which you get back when you coast downhill as kinetic energy or motion. Now, does all of the energy perfectly transform from form, one form to another? No. And that's one of the reasons when you exercise, you have a tendency to get very, very warm. A lot of energy just in the process of transformation will turn into heat. And that's what makes you perspire and sweat in order to try and keep your body cool. Here's another one of these energy cycles. The sun beats down on water molecules. The water molecules evaporate, go up, make clouds, and that gives the water molecules an awful lot of potential energy. The rain comes down and it puts water in high places, like in a lake. Now, that water still has potential energy, and as that water falls over the dam, potential energy is transformed into motion, and that motion via a turbine can be transformed into electricity. And that electricity is a very convenient form. It's real easy for us to use this kind of energy in our homes. And this can be then transformed into, again, motion to move the air and cool us down. It is one form of energy morphing into another. Now, the law of conservation of energy and the law of conservation of matter, saying matter cannot be created or destroyed, are rules that we've known about in science for hundreds of years. And they are, they are good rock solid rules. And these rules work in your and my everyday life. But a little over 125 years ago, Albert Einstein came up with something that said that energy can be converted into mass and mass can be converted into energy. And he did this using the most famous physics equation of all time, E equals mc squared, where E is energy measured in our old friend joules, m is mass measured in kilograms, that same unit we've been using, and C, little c stands for the speed of light. And the speed of light is very, very fast, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. It's a big, 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 big number is the speed of light. And then you square it, which makes these all lots and lots bigger. Now, as I mentioned, in our everyday life, we don't have to worry about E equals mc squared. And that's why it wasn't until, until over 100 years ago that we found this E equals mc squared. But I would be fibbing to you if I did not mention the law of conservation of mass and energy. Since both of these work, and Einstein said you can transform one into the other, well, when you start getting in extreme situations, like nuclear situations and subatomic particles, then you have to mess with the law of conservation of mass and energy. Mass can be converted into energy, and energy can be converted back into mass. It's not normal unless you have a nuclear power plant in your garage, um, but it can happen. Now, in a nuclear power plant, something like one kilogram of fissionable material, one kilogram is about 2.2 pounds, can be used to power this power plant, and that is enough energy for a small city for one year. That's amazing, but it is a direct transformation of a little bit of matter into a whole lot of energy. This is the same process that is used in our star. Our sun does something called nuclear fusion, where it takes little atoms like hydrogen and it 
packs them together really, really tight, making heavier atoms like helium. And there's a little extra mass that's lost. This actually weighs less than the sum of its parts. So where did the extra energy go? Well, the extra energy that was lost when you took this and you piled them together nice and tight, that extra lost energy gets, excuse me, mass gets transformed into energy. And that energy is what powers our star. If you have subatomic particles, and these are the kind of things that are seen in a particle accelerator like Fermilab down in Batavia, Illinois, or CERN, which is the big particle accelerator on the Swiss-French border. They take little streams of subatomic particles, they slam them together at near the speed of light, and then lots and lots of gunk comes out. Well, some of the gunk here is what is referred to as virtual particles. These are particles that are too hot, too energetic to actually exist at room temperature, but they exist for fractions of an instant inside these particle accelerators. Mass is actually made out of the tremendous amount of energy of those collisions. And some of those particles are things like W and Z particles and uh, quarks and uh, things like that that we don't normally see in our everyday life. Now, what is the ultimate source of energy for you? All right, you eat vegetables, some of you eat meats, and some of you do not eat meat, but we eat our food and it goes into us and it gives us the energy to move, to climb, to study, and to stay warm. But what is the ultimate source of your energy? What actually powers you? Well, you get that energy from the food, so the question is, where does the food get its energy from? Do you remember photosynthesis back when you took biology? Because the sun shines on the plants, and via the process of photosynthesis, the energy is transformed from solar energy into chemical energy. The cows then eat the grass, we eat the grass and the cows, and just like Superman, you and I are actually solar powered. If we did not have a star constantly adding energy to our beautiful, beautiful planet Earth, we would have a dead world. You and I couldn't exist, puppies, kitties, and wildebeests could not exist. So. Next time you're feeling down, just think, I'm just like Superman. And you certainly, certainly are. All right, see you next time. <laughs>